I want to talk to you about the Electoral College and why it matters. All right, I know this doesn't sound like the most sensational topic of the day, but stay with me because I promise you it's one of the most important. To explain why requires a very brief civics review. The President and Vice President of the United States are not chosen by a nationwide popular vote of the American people. Rather, they are chosen by 538 electors. This process is spelled out in the United States Constitution. Why didn't the founders just make it easy and let the presidential candidate with the most votes claim victory? Why did they create, and why do we continue to need this electoral college? The answer is critical to understanding not only the electoral college, but also America. The founders had no intention of creating a pure majority rule democracy. They knew from careful study of history what most have forgotten today or never learned. Pure democracies do not work. They implode. Democracy has been colorfully described as two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. In a pure democracy, bare majorities can easily tyrannize the rest of a country. The founders wanted to avoid this at all costs. This is why we have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. It's why each state has two senators, no matter what its population, but also different numbers of representatives based entirely on population. It's why it takes a supermajority in Congress and three quarters of the states to change the Constitution. And it's why we have the Electoral College. Here's how the Electoral College works. The presidential election happens in two phases. The first phase is purely democratic. We hold 51 popular elections every presidential election year, one in each state and one in D.C. On election day in 2012, you may have thought you were voting for Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, but you were really voting for a slate of presidential electors. In Rhode Island, for example, if you voted for Barack Obama, you voted for the state's four Democratic electors. If you voted for Mitt Romney, you were really voting for the state's four Republican electors. Part two of the election is held in December, and it is this December election among the state's 538 electors, not the November election, which officially determines the identity of the next president. At least 270 votes are needed to win. Why is this so important? because the system encourages coalition building and national campaigning. In order to win, a candidate must have the support of many different types of voters from various parts of the country. Winning only the South or the Midwest is not good enough. You cannot win 270 electoral votes if only one part of the country is supporting you. But if winning were only about getting the most votes, a candidate might concentrate all of his efforts in the biggest cities or the biggest states. Why would that candidate care about what people in West Virginia or Iowa or Montana think? But you might ask, isn't the election really only about the so-called swing states? Actually, no. If nothing else, safe and swing states are constantly changing. California voted safely Republican as recently as 1988. Texas used to vote Democrat. Neither New Hampshire nor Virginia used to be swing states. Most people think that George W. Bush won the 2000 election because of Florida. Well, sort of, but he really won the election because he managed to flip one state which the Democrats thought was safe, West Virginia. Its four electoral votes turned out to be decisive. No political party can ignore any state for too long without suffering the consequences. Every state, and therefore every voter in every state, is important. The Electoral College also makes it harder to steal elections. Votes must be stolen in the right state in order to change the outcome of the Electoral College. With so many swing states, this is hard to predict and hard to do. But without the Electoral College, any vote stolen in any precinct in the country could affect the national outcome, even if that vote was easily stolen in the bluest California precinct or the reddest Texas one. The Electoral College is an ingenious method of selecting a president for a great, diverse republic such as our own. It protects against the tyranny of the majority, encourages coalition building, and discourages voter fraud. Our founders were proud of it. We can be too. I'm Tara Ross for Prager University. Being a normal boy is a serious liability in today's classroom. Boys tend to be disorganized and restless, 
Some have even been known to be noisy and hard to manage. Sound like any boy you know? But increasingly, our schools have little patience for what only a couple of decades ago would have been described as boyishness. As psychologist Michael Thompson has aptly observed, girls' behavior is the gold standard in schools. Boys are treated like defective girls. Now, as a result, these defective girls are not faring well academically. Compared with girls, boys earn lower grades, they win fewer honors, they're far less likely to go to college. Boys are languishing academically while girls are prospering. In an ever more knowledge-based economy, this is not a recipe for a successful society. We need to start thinking about how we can make our grade school classrooms more boy-friendly. Well, here are four reforms that would make a very good start. One, turn boys into readers. In all age groups, across all ethnic lines, boys score lower than girls on national reading tests. Good reading skills, need I say, are critical to academic and workplace success. A major study in the UK discovered, not surprisingly, that girls prefer fiction, magazines, and poetry, while boys prefer comics and nonfiction. Boys whose eyes glaze over if forced to read Little House on the Prairie uh, may be riveted by the Guinness Book of Records. Cool. Boys will read if given materials that interest them. If you're looking for suggestions for books that have proved irresistible to boys, go to guysread.com. Two, inspire the male imagination. Celebrated writing instructor Ralph Fletcher contends that too many teachers take what is called the confessional poet as the classroom ideal. Personal narratives full of emotions and self-disclosure, these are stories girls commonly write, and these are prized, whereas action stories describing, say, a skateboard competition or a monster devouring a city, these are not. I recently read about a third grader in Southern California named Justin who loved science fiction, pirates, and battles. Well, an alarmed teacher summoned his parents to school to discuss the picture the eight-year-old had drawn of a sword fight, which included several decapitated heads. The teacher expressed grave concern about Justin's values. The boy's father was astonished, huh? not by his son's drawing, which to him was typical boy stuff, but by the teacher's overwrought and female-centered reaction. If boys are constantly subject to disapproval for their interests and enthusiasms, they're likely to become disengaged and lag further behind. Our schools need to work with, not against, the kinetic imaginations of boys. Three, zero out, zero tolerance. Boys are nearly five times as likely to be expelled from preschool as girls. And in grades K through 12, boys account for nearly 70% of suspensions. Now, this is often for minor acts of insubordination and sometimes for entirely innocent behavior. Hardly a week goes by without a news story about a young boy running afoul of a school's zero tolerance policy. Josh Welsh, age seven, was recently sent home from his Maryland school for nibbling off the corners of a strawberry Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. Josh, like many other boys punished for violating zero tolerance policies, was guilty of nothing more than being a typical seven-year-old boy. Four, bring back recess. Believe it or not, recess may soon be a thing of the past. According to research summarized by the Science Daily, since the 1970s, school children have lost close to 50% of their unstructured outdoor playtime. And much loved games have vanished from schoolyards. In schools throughout the country, games like dodgeball, Red Rover, even tag, have all but disappeared. Too damaging to self-esteem or too violent being the usual excuse. One popular classroom guide suggests tug of war be replaced with tug of peace. Boys need to work off their energy. They need to be free to play games they enjoy. And keeping them cooped up and inside all day will not help them learn. As our schools become more feeling-centered, more competition-free, more sedentary, they move further away from the needs of boys. We need to reverse the boy-averse trends.
Male underachievement is everyone's concern. These are our sons. These are the young men with whom our daughters will build a future. If boys are in trouble, so are we all. I'm Christina Hoff Summers at the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. When you think about racial equality and civil rights, which political party comes to mind? The Republicans or the Democrats? Most people would probably say the Democrats, but this answer is incorrect. Since its founding in 1829, the Democratic Party has fought against every major civil rights initiative and has a long history of discrimination. The Democratic Party defended slavery, started the Civil War, opposed Reconstruction, founded the Ku Klux Klan, imposed segregation, perpetrated lynchings, and fought against the Civil Rights Acts of the 1950s and 1960s. In contrast, the Republican Party was founded in 1854 as an anti-slavery party. Its mission was to stop the spread of slavery into the new Western territories with the aim of abolishing it entirely. This effort, however, was dealt a major blow by the Supreme Court in the 1857 case, Dred Scott versus Sandford. The court ruled that slaves aren't citizens, they're property. The seven justices who voted in favor of slavery, all Democrats, the two justices who dissented, both Republicans. The slavery question was, of course, ultimately resolved by a bloody civil war. The commander in chief during that war was the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, the man who freed the slaves. Six days after the Confederate army surrendered, John Wilkes Booth, a Democrat, assassinated President Lincoln. Lincoln's vice president, a Democrat named Andrew Johnson, assumed the presidency. But Johnson adamantly opposed Lincoln's plan to integrate the newly freed slaves into the South's economic and social order. Johnson and the Democratic Party were unified in their opposition to the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment, which gave blacks citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks the vote. All three passed only because of universal Republican support. During the era of Reconstruction, federal troops stationed in the South helped secure rights for the newly freed slaves. Hundreds of black men were elected to Southern state legislatures as Republicans, and 22 black Republicans served in the U.S. Congress by 1900. The Democrats did not elect a black man to Congress until 1935. But after Reconstruction ended, when the federal troops went home, Democrats roared back into power in the South. They quickly reestablished white supremacy across the region with measures like black codes, laws that restricted the ability of blacks to own property and run businesses, and they imposed poll taxes and literacy tests used to subvert black citizens' right to vote. And how was all of this enforced? by terror, much of it instigated by the Ku Klux Klan, founded by a Democrat, Nathan Bedford Forrest. As historian Eric Foner, himself a Democrat, notes, in effect, the Klan was a military force serving the interests of the Democratic Party. President Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, shared many views with the Klan. He resegregated many federal agencies and even screened the first movie ever played at the White House the racist film, The Birth of a Nation, originally entitled The Klansman. A few decades later, the only serious congressional opposition to the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964 came from Democrats. 80% of Republicans in Congress supported the bill, less than 70% of Democrats did. Democratic senators filibustered the bill for 75 days until Republicans mustered the few extra votes needed to break the log jam. And when all of their efforts to enslave blacks, keep them enslaved, and then keep them from voting had failed, the Democrats came up with a new strategy. If black people are going to vote, 
they might as well vote for Democrats, as President Lyndon Johnson was purported to have said about the Civil Rights Act, I'll have them as voting Democrat for 200 years. So now, the Democratic Party prospers on the votes of the very people it has spent much of its history oppressing. Democrats falsely claim that the Republican Party is the villain, when in reality, it's the failed policies of the Democratic Party that have kept blacks down. Massive government welfare has decimated the black family. Opposition to school choice has kept them trapped in failing schools. Politically correct policing has left black neighborhoods defenseless against violent crime. So when you think about racial equality and civil rights, which political party should come to mind? I'm Carol Swain, professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University for Prager University. Do you believe in free speech? Do you believe that people should be judged by their character, not their skin color? Do you believe in freedom of religion? If you believe these things, you're probably not a progressive. You might think you're a progressive. I used to think I was. My show, The Rubin Report, was originally part of the Progressive Young Turks Network. Progressives struck me as liberals, but louder. Progressives were the nice guys. They looked out for the little guy. They cared about women and minorities. They embraced change. In short, who wouldn't want to be a progressive? But over the last couple of years, the meaning of the word progressive has changed. Progressives used to say, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Not anymore. Banning speakers whose opinions you don't agree with from college campuses, that's not progressive. Prohibiting any words not approved of as politically correct, that's not progressive. Putting trigger warnings on books, movies, music, anything that might offend people, that's not progressive either. All of this has led me to believe that much of the left is no longer progressive, but regressive. This is one of the reasons I've spent so much time on my show talking about the regressive left. This regressive ideology doesn't judge people as individuals, but as a collective. If you're black or female or Muslim or Hispanic or member of any other minority group, you're judged differently than the most evil of all things, a white Christian male. The regressive left ranks minority groups in a pecking order to compete in a kind of oppression Olympics. Gold medal goes to the most offended. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream that his children would be judged by their character and not their skin color was a liberal idea, but these days it's not a progressive ideal. And what about religious freedom, the idea that no one else can tell you what you have to believe? Surely progressives still support that basic right. Well, not so much. I'm a married gay man, so you might think that I appreciate the government forcing a Christian baker or photographer or florist to act against their religion in order to cater, photograph, or decorate my wedding. But you'd be wrong. A government that can force Christians to violate their conscience can force me to violate mine. If a baker won't bake you a cake, find another baker. Don't demand that the state tell him what to do with his private business. I'm pro-choice, but a government that can force a group of Catholic nuns, literally called the Little Sisters of the Poor, to violate their faith and pay for abortion-inducing birth control can force anyone to do anything. That's not progressive, that's regressive. Today's progressivism has become a faux moral movement hurling charges of racism, bigotry, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and a slew of other meaningless buzzwords at anyone they disagree with. The battle of ideas has been replaced by a battle of feelings, and outrage has replaced honesty. Diversity reigns supreme as long as it's not that pesky diversity of thought. This isn't the recipe for a free society, it's a recipe for authoritarianism. For these reasons, I can no longer call myself a progressive. I don't really call myself a Democrat either. I'm a classical liberal, a free thinker, and as much as I don't like to admit it, defending my liberal values has suddenly become a conservative position. So if you think people should be able to say what they think without being punished for it, that people should be judged by their behavior, not their skin color, 
and that people should be able to live the way that they want to live without government interference, then there's not much left on the left for you. I'll keep trying to explain that to progressives until I'm totally left out. I'm Dave Rubin of The Rubin Report for Prager University. Race and ethnicity have defined every nation on Earth, except one, the United States of America. It is defined by values. So to understand America, you have to understand American values. They are, one, e pluribus unum, Two, liberty. Three, in God we trust. I call this the American Trinity. I made up the name, but I didn't make up the values. They are on every American coin. The first, e pluribus unum, is Latin, meaning out of many, one. When first adopted as an American motto, shortly after the American founding in 1776, it referred to the 13 American colonies becoming one nation. Over time, however, most Americans understood the motto to mean one people from many backgrounds. To quote the E Pluribus Unum Project, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, over the years, E Pluribus Unum has also served as a reminder of America's bold attempt to make one unified nation of people from many different backgrounds and beliefs. In other words, America doesn't care about your national or ethnic origins. This explains why people who immigrate to America assimilate faster and more fully than immigrants to any other country. Few of those who have immigrated to Europe from, for example, Turkey, as millions have, are not considered fully German by fellow Germans or fully Swedish by fellow Swedes or fully Spanish by fellow Spaniards. This is even true of the children and grandchildren of those immigrants. And just as important, few of those immigrants or their children or grandchildren will ever feel fully German, Swedish, or Spanish. But a Turk who immigrates to the United States will be regarded as fully American, as American as any other American, the moment he or she becomes a citizen. And they, and certainly their children, will feel fully American. Of course, America has not always lived up to this e pluribus unum ideal, but the ideal was always there, and it was applied to virtually every immigrant to America. The second component of the American Trinity is liberty. Now you might ask, didn't the French Revolution also enshrine liberty as a central national value? Wasn't its motto liberty, equality, fraternity? The answer is yes. America is hardly the only country to enshrine liberty. It is the only country to enshrine liberty e pluribus unum and in God we trust. What's the difference? The difference is this. The moment you affirm equality as the French Revolution did, you will lose liberty. It is a basic American value that all human beings are born equal and all must be equal before the law. But ending up equal, that's a French and European value. And if you want people to end up equal, you must deprive them of liberty which is exactly what happened right after the French Revolution and in every other society that made equality its national goal. America gives people the liberty to end up wherever their abilities, work ethic, and luck take them, meaning unequal. Therefore, professional athletes will make more money than teachers or doctors. That may be unfortunate, but that is what liberty allows. If you want equality, you will tell people how much they can earn And that means the end of liberty. And third, in God we trust. Unlike almost every other country, America never had a state religion. But it was founded on the principle that God, specifically the God of the Bible, is the source of moral values. As the Declaration of Independence put it, all people are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, Rights come from God, not from men. If rights are given by men, men can take them away. The American Trinity is the reason America became the world's freest and most prosperous country. But many Americans want to, in the words of former President Barack Obama, fundamentally transform it. They wish to replace American values with European values. Equality of result and an ever-expanding state which greatly reduce individual freedom, 
the celebration of ethnic and racial identity, which is the opposite of e pluribus unum, and the removal of God as the source of morality and rights. Which set of values Americans adopt will determine whether America remains free, prosperous, and the force for good in the world that it has been. With the exception of the Civil War, this is the greatest internal battle in American history. I'm Dennis Prager. I recently watched a group of protesters, most of them young, denouncing President Donald Trump's immigration policies. They were waving Mexican flags and shouting, Si se puede! Yes, we can. This is now the rallying cry of the open borders left, but it wasn't always. In fact, I wondered if a single person at the protest knew where it came from. The slogan first became famous 50 years ago, thanks to Cesar Chavez. He was the founder of the United Farm Workers Union. When Chavez said, si se puede, he meant something very different. Yes, we can seal the borders. Cesar Chavez hated illegal immigration. He was Hispanic, obviously, and definitely on the left, but he fought to keep illegal Mexican immigrants out of this country. He understood that peasants from Latin America will always work for less than Americans will. That's why employers prefer them. Chavez knew that. As long as we have a poor country bordering California, he once explained, it's going to be very difficult to win strikes. In 1969, Chavez led a march down the center of California to protest the hiring of illegal immigrant produce pickers. Marching alongside him was Democratic Senator Walter Mondale and the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the longtime aide to Martin Luther King. Ten years later, Chavez dispatched armed union members into the desert to assault Mexican nationals who were trying to sneak across the border. Chavez's men beat immigrants with chains and whips made of barbed wire. Illegal aliens who dared to work as scabs had their houses firebombed and their cars burned. Chavez wasn't embarrassed about any of this. He bragged about it. No matter. Chavez remains a progressive hero. President Obama declared his birthday a commemorative federal holiday. It's an official day off in a half a dozen states. There's a college named after him and dozens of public schools. Cesar Chavez's life is a reminder of how much the left has changed and how quickly. Until recently, most Democrats agreed with Chavez. They opposed unchecked immigration because they knew it hurt American workers, and they were right. One study by a Harvard economist examined the effects of the mass migration of Cuban refugees to this country in 1980, the so-called Marielle boat lift. He found that American workers in Miami with a high school education saw their wages fall by more than 30% after the refugees arrived. If you believe in supply and demand, this is not surprising. After the fall of Saigon in 1975, Democratic Governor Jerry Brown opposed letting Vietnamese refugees into California on the grounds that the state already had enough poor people. As he put it at the time, there's something a little strange about saying, let's bring in 500,000 more people when we can't take care of the 1 million Californians out of work. First-term Senator Joe Biden of Delaware agreed. He introduced federal legislation to curb the arrival of the Vietnamese. Two decades later, leading Democrats were still wary of mass immigration, especially illegal immigration. As Bill Clinton put it in the 1995 State of the Union address, Americans are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public services they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. No prominent Democrat would say anything like that today without being denounced as a racist. Clinton got a standing ovation. As late as 2006, there were still liberals who cared about the economic effects of immigration, legal or illegal. Immigration reduces the wages of domestic workers who compete with immigrants, explained economist Paul Krugman in the New York Times. We'll need to reduce the inflow of low-skilled immigrants. Mainly that means better controls on illegal immigration. That same year, Senator Hillary Clinton voted for a fence on the Mexican border. So did Barack Obama and Chuck Schumer and 23 other Senate Democrats. Not anymore. 20 years after Bill Clinton told Americans they had the right to be upset about illegal immigration, his wife scolded the country for enforcing border controls. So what changed? Not the economics of it. The law of supply and demand remained in effect. It's not a coincidence that as illegal immigration surged, wages for American workers stagnated. What changed is that Democrats stopped caring about those workers, about the middle class, really. Why? Here's the answer in four simple facts. One, according to a recent study from Yale, there are at least 22 million illegal immigrants living in the United States. Two, 
Democrats plan to give all of them citizenship. Read the Democrats' 2016 party platform. Three, studies show the overwhelming majority of first-time immigrant voters vote Democrat. Four, the biggest landslide in American presidential history was only 17 million votes. Do the math. The payoff for Democrats? Permanent electoral majority for the foreseeable future. In a word, power. That's the point, no matter what they tell you. American workers, be damned. I'm Tucker Carlson. Once upon a time, every student of history, and that meant pretty much everyone with a high school education, knew this. The Democratic Party was the party of slavery and Jim Crow, and the Republican Party was the party of emancipation and racial integration. Democrats were the Confederacy, and Republicans were the Union. Jim Crow Democrats were dominant in the South, and socially tolerant Republicans were dominant in the North. But then, in the 1960s and 70s, everything supposedly flipped. Suddenly, the Republicans became the racists, and the Democrats became the champions of civil rights. Fabricated by left-leaning academic elites and journalists, the story went like this. Republicans couldn't win a national election by appealing to the better nature of the country. They could only win by appealing to the worse. Attributed to Richard Nixon, the media's all-purpose bad guy, this came to be known as the Southern strategy. It was very simple. Win elections by winning the South. And to win the South, appeal to racists. So the Republicans, the party of Lincoln, were to now be labeled the party of rednecks. But this story of the two parties switching identities is a myth. In fact, it's three myths wrapped into one false narrative. Let's take a brief look at each myth in turn. Myth number one, in order to be competitive in the South, Republicans started to pander to white racists in the 1960s. Fact, Republicans actually became competitive in the South as early as 1928 when Republican Herbert Hoover won over 47% of the South's popular vote against Democrat Al Smith. In 1952, Republican President Dwight Eisenhower won the Southern states of Tennessee, Florida, and Virginia. And in 1956, he picked up Louisiana, Kentucky, and West Virginia too. And that was after he supported the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education that desegregated public schools, and after he sent the 101st Airborne to Little Rock Central High School to enforce integration. Myth number two, Southern Democrats angry with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 switched parties. Fact, of the 21 Democratic senators who opposed the Civil Rights Act, just one became a Republican. The other 20 continued to be elected as Democrats or were replaced by other Democrats. On average, those 20 seats didn't go Republican for another two and a half decades. Myth number three, since the implementation of the Southern strategy, the Republicans have dominated the South. Fact, Richard Nixon, the man who is often credited with creating the Southern strategy, lost the Deep South in 1968. In contrast, Democrat Jimmy Carter nearly swept the region in 1976 12 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in 1992, over 28 years later, Democrat Bill Clinton won Georgia, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. The truth is, Republicans didn't hold a majority of Southern congressional seats until 1994, 30 years after the Civil Rights Act. As Kevin Williamson of National Review writes, if Southern rednecks ditched the Democrats because of a civil rights law passed in 1964, it is strange that they waited until the late 1980s and early 1990s to do so. They say things move slower in the South, but not that slow. So what really happened? Why does the South now vote overwhelmingly Republican? Because the South itself has changed. Its values have changed. The racism that once defined it doesn't anymore. 
its values today are conservative ones, pro-life, pro-gun, and pro-small government. And here's the proof. Southern whites are far more likely to vote for a black conservative like Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina than a white liberal. In short, history has moved on. Like other regions of the country, the South votes values, not skin color. The myth of the Southern strategy is just the Democrats' excuse for losing the South, and yet another way to smear Republicans with the labor racists. Don't buy it. I'm Carol Swain, professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University for Prager University. I was raised a practicing Muslim and remained one for almost half my life. I attended madrasas, that is Islamic schools, and memorized large parts of the Quran. As a child, I lived in Mecca for a time and frequently visited the Grand Mosque. As a teenager, I sympathized with the Muslim Brotherhood. At 22, while my family was living in Kenya, my father arranged my marriage to a member of our family clan, a man that I had never met. I ran away, made my way to Holland, studied there, and eventually was elected a member of the Dutch parliament. Now I live in the United States. In short, I have seen Islam from the inside and the outside. I believe that a reform of Islam is necessary and possible, and only Muslims can make that reform a reality. But we in the West cannot remain on the sidelines as though the outcome of this struggle has nothing to do with us. If the jihadists win, and the hope for a reformed Islam dies, the rest of the world will pay a terrible price. The terror attacks in New York, London, Madrid, Paris, and many other places are only a preview for what's to come. For this reason, I believe that it's foolish to insist, as Western leaders habitually do, that the violent acts committed in the name of Islam can somehow be divorced from the religion itself. For more than a decade, my message has been simple. Islam is not a religion of peace. When I assert this, I do not mean that Islamic belief makes all Muslims violent. This is manifestly not the case. There are many millions of peaceful Muslims in the world. What I do say is that the call to violence and the justification for it are explicitly stated in the sacred texts of Islam. Moreover, this theologically sanctioned violence is there to be activated by any number of offenses, including, but not limited to, adultery, blasphemy, homosexuality, and apostasy, that is, to leave Islam. Those who tolerate this intolerance do so at their peril. As someone who has known what it is to live without freedom, I watch in amazement as those who call themselves liberals and progressives, people who claim to believe so fervently in individual liberty and minority rights, make a common cause with the forces in the world that manifestly pose the greatest threat to that very freedom and those very minorities. In 2014, I was invited to accept an honorary degree from Brandeis University for the work I have done on behalf of women's rights in the Muslim world. That invitation was withdrawn after professors and students protested my criticism of Islam. My subsequent disinvitation, as it came to be called, was no favor to Muslims just the opposite. By labeling critical examination of Islam as inherently racist, we make the chances of reformation far less likely. There are no limits on criticism of Christianity at American universities or anywhere else for that matter. Why should there be of Islam? Instead of contorting Western intellectual traditions so as not to offend our Muslim fellow citizens, we need to defend both those traditions and the Muslim dissidents who take great risks to promote them. We should support these brave men and women in every way possible. Imagine a platform for Muslim dissidents that communicated their message through YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. These are the Muslims we should be supporting for our sake as much as for the sake of Islam. In the Cold War, the West celebrated dissidents such as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Andrei Sakharov, and Vaclav Havel who had the courage to challenge the Soviet system from within. Today, there are many dissidents who challenge Islam, but the West either ignores them or dismisses them as not representative. This is a grave mistake. 
Reformers such as Taufik Hamid, Asra Nomani, and Zuhi Jasser, and many others must be supported and protected. They should be as well known as Solzhenitsyn, Sakharov, and Havelwa in the 1980s. If we do in fact support political, social, and religious freedom, then we cannot in good conscience give Islam a free pass on the grounds of multicultural sensitivity. We need to say to Muslims living in the West, if you want to live in our societies, to share in their material benefits, then you need to accept that our freedoms are not optional. Islam is at a crossroads of reformation or self-destruction, but so is the West. I'm Ayan Hirsi Ali of Harvard University for Prager University. Once upon a time, there were three brothers, triplets, named Tom, Dick, and Harry Class. They were raised in the same home with the same parents, had the same IQ, same skills, and same opportunities. Each was married and had two children. They were all carpenters making $25 per hour. While they were very similar in all these respects, they had different priorities. For example, Tom chose to work 20 hours per week, while his brother Dick worked 40 hours, and Harry, 60. It should also be noted that Harry's wife worked full-time as an office manager for a salary of $50,000. Dick's wife sold real estate part-time 10 hours a week and made $25,000 per year. Tom's wife did not work. Tom and Dick spent all of their family income. Since they paid into Social Security, they figured they didn't need to save for retirement. Harry and his wife, on the other hand, had, over many years, put away money each month and invested it in stocks and bonds. Here's how it worked out. Tom made $25,000 a year. Dick and his wife made $75,000. And Harry and his wife, $150,000. When a new housing development opened up in their community, the brothers decided to buy equally priced homes on the same private street. One day, the brothers decided to pool their funds for the purpose of improving their street, concerned about crime and safety, and wanting a more attractive setting for their homes, the three families decided to install a security gate at the street's entrance, repave the street's surface, and enhance the lighting and landscaping. The work was done for a total cost of $30,000. Harry assumed they would divide the bill three ways, each brother paying $10,000. But Tom and Dick objected. Hmm. Why should we pay the same as you? They said, you make much more money than we do. Harry was puzzled. What does that have to do with anything, he asked. My family makes more money because my wife and I work long hours and because we have saved some of the money we've earned to make additional money from investments. Why should we be penalized for that? Harry, you can work and save all you like, Tom countered. But my wife and I want to enjoy ourselves now, not 25 years from now. Fine, Tom. Do what you want. It's a free country. But why should I have to pay for that? I can't believe you're being so unbrotherly, Tom argued. You have a lot of money and I don't. I thought you'd be more generous. Hmm. At this point, Dick, the peacemaker in the family, entered the conversation. I've got an idea, Dick said. Our combined income is $250,000, and $30,000 is 12% of that amount. Why don't we each pay that percentage of our income? Under that formula, Tom would pay $3,000, I would pay $9,000, and Harry would pay $18,000. I have a much better idea, said Tom, and one that's fairer than what you're proposing. Dick and Harry turned to Tom. Harry should pay $23,450. Dick, you should pay $6,550. And I will pay nothing. To Dick, this sounded completely arbitrary and not really fair, but it did have one big plus. His share would be $2,450 less under Tom's formula than under his own. So he decided to be silent. Harry, however, was stunned. You want me to pay almost 80% of the bill despite the fact that each of us is receiving the exact same benefits? Where did you get such a crazy idea? From no less an authority than the U.S. government, Tom responded as he pulled out a gray booklet. It's all right here in the IRS tax tables. This is the progressive income tax system all U.S. taxpayers live under, and I don't see why we should be any different. In fact, I believe all future improvements should be paid in this way. Works for me, said Dick. 
So, by a vote of two to one, the cost of the street improvements was divided as Tom had proposed, even though they benefited equally, and even though the reason Harry had more money was that he and his wife had worked many more hours than his brothers and their wives, and had saved some of what they had earned, instead of spending it all. Tom and Dick lived happily ever after with their new arrangement. Harry grumbled a lot, but whenever he complained, his brothers called him greedy and selfish. The End I live in Guatemala and I work throughout Latin America. And I want to speak to the millions of fortunate Hispanic immigrants living in the United States, legally or not. I have a question for you. Why do you support the same policies in the US that cause you to flee your home country? The policies I'm talking about are those that lead to a bigger and bigger central government. You know only too well that the more power the government has, the more corrupt it becomes. My home country, like most other nations in Central and South America, is very poor. 54% of the population lives in poverty, and 13% live in extreme poverty. Half of all children under five are chronically malnourished. Crippling government corruption is the norm. Opening a new business can take months, even years, because of a multitude of regulations that are designed to line the pockets of bureaucrats so the cost is much too high for the average citizen. Quite simply, unless you're politically connected in Guatemala, you probably want to leave. And in the last 20 years, many Guatemalans have left. Or to put it more honestly, they fled. The fortunate ones reached the United States, the freest and wealthiest nation in human history. There are at least one million Guatemalans living in the US. Nearly every Mexican and Central and South American immigrant in the United States whether they immigrated legally or illegally, moved or fled to the U.S. for the same reasons, economic opportunity and the freedom to shape their own lives. In short, you came to the United States to participate in what Americans call the American dream. But have you ever asked yourself, why is the United States so free, so much less corrupt and so much more affluent than any Latin American country? The answer lies first and foremost in the unique American belief in limited government. Why? Because the smaller the government, the less the corruption. And the smaller the government, the more individual freedom and personal responsibility. And given those things, along with hard work and talent, you can accomplish your life's goals. So back to my question. Why would you support policies that keep expanding the power of the government when they are the very policies that doom your home countries? Is it because you think that when Democrats offer you free stuff, it means they really care about you? Do you think that when Republicans talk about enforcing immigration laws, it means they are going to send you back? Let's be honest, you didn't come here for free stuff. You came for the economic opportunity that allows you to work and earn. And of course, a nation has an obligation to enforce its borders. Certainly, every country in Central and South America does. In fact, much more so than the US. Perhaps you believe that your home country is poor not because of failed socialism and corrupt big government, but because of issues unrelated to ideology. Not enough natural resources, imperialism, and so on. Or worse, you believe that the U.S. has gotten rich on the backs of poor nations. But these narratives are false. There are many nations blessed with abundant natural resources that are poor. And they are poor overwhelmingly because of corrupt governments and policies that destroy incentives to produce. Look at Venezuela, which has vast oil and mineral reserves, but has shortages of every basic necessity. Why? because of socialist policies, because of those same deceiving politicians who promise to fight for the people and give you free stuff. And you're going to fall for these lies again in your adopted country? Do you think by electing politicians who will fight for the people, fight for social justice, and raise taxes on the 1% who are exploiting the wealth of the 99% that you will get ahead? In other words, will you support the same policies and vote for the same types of politicians here who made such a mess back home? 
the United States became wealthy because its government stayed out of the way of its citizens. The more power you give to the government, the less power you have to control your own life. Prosperity and opportunity diminish as government grows. So why did you, like so many of my fellow Guatemalans, come to the US? Because your society was broken. You chose to make a new life in the United States. You could have gone to another Latin American country with a similar culture and the same language as your home country, but you didn't. Because the United States is different. Please, help keep it that way. I'm Gloria Alvarez, author of The Populist Deception for Prager University. You may not realize it, but you are currently funding some dangerous people. They are indoctrinating young minds throughout the West with their resentment-ridden ideology. They have made it their life's mission to undermine Western civilization itself, which they regard as corrupt, oppressive, and patriarchal. If you're a taxpayer or paying for your kid's liberal arts degree, you're underwriting this gang of nihilists. You're supporting ideologues who claim that all truth is subjective, that all sex differences are socially constructed, and that Western imperialism is the sole source of all third world problems. They are the postmodernists, pushing progressive activism at a college near you. They produce the mobs that violently shut down campus speakers, the language police who enshrine into law use of fabricated gender pronouns, and the deans whose livelihoods depend on madly rooting out discrimination where little or none exists. Their thinking took hold in Western universities in the 60s and 70s when the true believers of the radical left became the professors of today. And now we rack up education-related debt, not so that our children learn to think critically, write clearly, or speak properly, but so they can model their mentor's destructive agenda. It's now possible to complete an English degree and never encounter Shakespeare, one of those dead white males whose works underlie our society of oppression. To understand and oppose the postmodernists, the ideas by which they orient themselves must be clearly identified. First is their new unholy trinity of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is defined not by opinion, but by race, ethnicity, or sexual identity. Equity is no longer the laudable goal of equality of opportunity, but the insistence on equality of outcome. And inclusion is the use of identity-based quotas to attain this misconceived state of equity. All the classic rights of the West are to be considered secondary to these new values. Take, for example, freedom of speech, the very pillar of democracy. The postmodernists refuse to believe that people of goodwill can exchange ideas and reach consensus. Their world is instead a Hobbesian nightmare of identity groups warring for power. They don't see ideas that run contrary to their ideology as simply incorrect. They see them as integral to the oppressive system they wish to supplant and consider it a moral obligation to stifle and constrain their expression. Second is rejection of the free market, of the very idea that free voluntary trading benefits everyone. They won't acknowledge that capitalism has lifted up hundreds of millions of people so they can, for the first time in history, afford food, shelter, clothing, transportation, even entertainment and travel. Those classified as poor in the U.S. and increasingly everywhere else are able to meet their basic needs. Meanwhile, in once prosperous Venezuela, until recently the poster child of the campus radicals, the middle class lines up for toilet paper. Third and finally are the politics of identity. Postmodernists don't believe in individuals. You're an exemplar of your race, sex, or sexual preference. You're also either a victim or an oppressor. No wrong can be done by anyone in the former group, and no good by the latter. Such ideas of victimization do nothing but justify the use of power and engender intergroup conflict. All these concepts originated with Karl Marx, the 19th century German philosopher. Marx viewed the world as a gigantic class struggle, the bourgeoisie against the proletariat, the grasping rich against the desperate poor. But wherever his ideas were put into practice, in the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cambodia, to name just a few, whole economies failed and tens of millions were killed. We fought a decades-long Cold War to stop the spread of those murderous notions, but they're back in the new guise of identity politics. 
The corrupt ideas of the postmodern neo-Marxists should be consigned to the dustbin of history. Instead, we underwrite their continuance in the very institutions where the central ideas of the West should be transmitted across the generations. Unless we stop, postmodernism will do to America and the entire Western world what it's already done to its universities. I'm Jordan Peterson, Professor of Psychology at the University of Toronto for Prager University. There are only two things I can tell you today that come with absolutely no agenda. The first is congratulations. The second is good luck. Everything else is what I like to call the dirty truth, which is just another way of saying it's my opinion. And in my opinion, you have all been given some terrible advice. And that advice is this, follow your passion. Every time I watch the Oscars, I cringe when some famous movie star, trophy in hand, starts to deconstruct the secret of their success. It's always the same thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have what it takes, kid. And the ever popular, never give up on your dreams. Look, I understand the importance of persistence and the value of encouragement, but who tells a stranger to never give up on their dreams without even knowing what it is they're dreaming? I mean, how can Lady Gaga possibly know where your passion will lead you? Have these people never seen American Idol? Year after year, thousands of aspiring American idols show up with great expectations only to learn that they don't possess the skills they thought they did. What's really amazing, though, is not their lack of talent. The world's full of people who can't sing. It's their genuine shock at being rejected. The incredible realization that their passion and their ability had nothing to do with each other. Look, if we're talking about your hobby, by all means, let your passion lead you. But when it comes to making a living, it's easy to forget the dirty truth. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you won't suck at it. And just because you've earned a degree in your chosen field, it doesn't mean you're gonna find your dream job. Dream jobs are usually just that, dreams. But their imaginary existence just might keep you from exploring careers that offer a legitimate chance to perform meaningful work and develop a genuine passion for the job you already have. Because here's another dirty truth. Your happiness on the job has very little to do with the work itself. On Dirty Jobs, I remember a very successful septic tank cleaner, a multimillionaire who told me the secret to his success. I looked around to see where everyone else was headed, he said, and then I went the opposite way. Then I got good at my work. Then I began to prosper. And then one day I realized I was passionate about other people's crap. I've heard that same basic story from welders, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, HVAC professionals, hundreds of other skilled tradesmen who followed opportunity, not passion, and prospered as a result. Consider the reality of the current job market. Right now, millions of people with degrees and diplomas are out there competing for a relatively narrow set of opportunities that polite society calls good careers. Now, meanwhile, employers are struggling to fill nearly 5.8 million jobs that nobody's trained to do. This is the skills gap. It's real, and its cause is actually very simple. When people follow their passion, they miss out on all kinds of opportunities they didn't even know existed. When I was 16, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. He was a skilled tradesman, could build a house without a blueprint. That was my passion, and I followed it for years. I took all the shop classes at school. I did all I could to absorb the knowledge and skill that came so easily to my granddad. Unfortunately, the handy gene is recessive. It skipped right over me, and I struggled mightily to overcome my deficiencies, but I couldn't. I was one of those contestants on American Idol who believed his passion was enough to ensure his success. One day, I brought home a sconce I had made in wood shop. It looked like a paramecium. After a heavy sigh, my granddad gave me the best advice I've ever received. He told me, Mike, you can still be a tradesman, but only if you get yourself a different kind of toolbox. At the time, 
this felt contrary to everything I believed about the importance of passion and persistence and staying the course. But of course he was right, because staying the course, that only makes sense if you're headed in a sensible direction. And while passion is way too important to be without, it is way too fickle to follow around. Which brings us to the final dirty truth. Never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Congratulations again, and good luck. I'm Mike Rowe from MicroWorks for Prager University. If every high school principal gave the following speech, America would be a much better place. To the students and faculty of our high school, I am your new principal and honored to be so. There is no greater calling than to teach young people. I would like to apprise you of some important changes coming to our school. First, this school will no longer honor race or ethnicity. I could not care less if you are black, brown, red, yellow, or white. I could not care less if your origins are African, European, Latin American, or Asian, or if your ancestors arrived here on the Mayflower or on slave ships. The only identity this school will recognize is your individual identity, your character, your scholarship, your humanity. And the only national identity this school will recognize is American. This is an American public school, and American public schools were created to make better Americans. If you wish to affirm here an ethnic or racial identity, or a national identity other than American, you will have to attend another school. This includes after-school clubs. I will not authorize clubs that divide students based on identities such as race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or whatever else may become in vogue in our society. Those clubs cultivate narcissism, an unhealthy preoccupation with the self, while the purpose of education is to get you to think beyond yourself. The school's clubs will be based on interests and passions, clubs that transport you to the wonders and glories of art, music, astronomy, languages you do not already speak, and more. If the only extracurricular activities you can imagine being interested in are those based on ethnicity, race, or sexual identity, that means that little outside of yourself really interests you. Second, I do not care whether English is your native language. My only interest in terms of language is that you leave this school speaking and writing English as fluently as possible. The English language has united America's citizens for over 200 years, and it will unite us at this school. Furthermore, I would be remiss in my duty to ensure that you will be prepared to successfully compete in the job market if you leave this school without excellent English language skills. We will learn other languages here. It's deplorable that most Americans only speak English. But if you want classes taught in your native language rather than in English, this is not the right school for you. Third, because I regard learning as a sacred endeavor, everything in this school will reflect learning's elevated status. This means, among other things, that you and your teachers will dress accordingly. There will be a dress code at this school. And you will address all teachers by their title, not by their first name. They are your teachers, not your pals. Fourth, no obscene language will be tolerated anywhere on this school's property. By obscene language, I mean the words banned on radio and television, plus epithets such as the B-word, even when addressed by one girl to another, or the N-word, even when used by one black student to another. It is my intent that by the time you leave this school, you will be among the few your age to distinguish between the elevated and the degraded, the holy and the obscene. Fifth. We will end all self-esteem programs. In this school, self-esteem will be attained in only one way, 
the only way self-esteem can be attained, by earning it. One immediate consequence is that graduating classes will have one valedictorian, not eight. Sixth and last, I am reorienting the school toward academics and away from politics and propaganda. No more time will be devoted to racism, sexism, Islamophobia, homophobia, global warming, tobacco, or gender identity. No more classes will be devoted to condom wearing and teaching you to regard sexual relations as no more than a health issue. And there will be no more attempts to convince you that you are a victim because you are not white or male or heterosexual or Christian. This school will have failed if any of you graduate without considering him or herself inordinately lucky. Lucky to be alive and lucky to be an American. Now please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. As many of you do not know the words, your teachers will hand them out to you. I'm Dennis Prager. If for the same work women only make 77 cents for every dollar a man makes, why don't businesses hire only women? Wages are the biggest expense for most businesses, so hiring only women would reduce costs by nearly a quarter, and that would go right to the bottom line. Don't businesses want to be profitable? Or are they really just bad at math? Well, actually, it's the feminists, celebrities, and politicians spreading this wage gap myth who have the math problem. Here's why. The 77 cents on the dollar statistic is calculated by dividing the median earnings of all women working full-time by the median earnings of all men working full-time. In other words, if the average income of all men is, say, $40,000 a year, and the average annual income of all women is, say, $30,800, that would mean that women earn 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. 30,800 divided by 40,000 equals 0.77. But these calculations don't reveal a gender wage injustice because they don't take into account occupation, position, education, or hours worked per week. Even a study by the American Association of University Women, a feminist organization, shows that the actual wage gap shrinks to only 6.6 .6 cents when you factor in different choices men and women make. And the key word here is choice. The small wage gap that does exist has nothing to do with paying women less, let alone with sexism. It has to do with differences in individual career choices that men and women make. In 2009, the U.S. Department of Labor released a paper that examined more than 50 peer-reviewed studies and concluded that the off-site at 23 cent wage gap may be almost entirely the result of individual choices being made by both male and female workers. Well, let's look at some of those choices. Georgetown University compiled a list of the five best-paying college majors and the percentage of men and women majoring in those fields. Number one best-paying major, petroleum engineering, 87% male. Number two, pharmaceutical sciences, 48% male. Three, mathematics and computer science, 67% male. Four, aerospace engineering, 88% male. Five, chemical engineering, 72% male. Notice that women outrepresent men in only one of the five top paying majors by only a few percentage points. Now consider the same studies list of the five worst paying college majors. Number one, counseling and psychology, 74% female. Two, early childhood education, 97% female. Three, theology and religious vocations, 66% male. Four, Human Services and Community Organization, 81% female. And five, Social Work, 88% female. Here, it's the women who lead in all but one category. Even within the same profession, men and women make different career choices that impact how much money they make. Take nursing, where male nurses, on the whole, earn 18% more than female nurses. The reason? Male nurses gravitate to the best-paying nursing specialties, they work longer hours, and disproportionately find jobs in cities with the highest compensation. Now here's how one expert on nursing compensation, Professor Linda Aiken of the University of Pennsylvania, sums up the data. 
Career choices and educational differences explain most, if not all, the gender gap in nursing. The Department of Labor paper concluded that once these differences are accounted for across all professions, the unexplained wage gap is somewhere between 4.8 and 7 percent, almost identical to the 6.6 percentage gap found by the AAUW. But why is there any gap at all? No one knows for sure, as both the AAUW and the Labor Department concede. There are so many variables that drive wages that no single study can cover them all. Few wage gap studies control for variables such as dangerous work environment. Men are vastly overrepresented, for example, on oil rigs. And here's another variable. Men are more willing and able to work long hours without advance notice. According to Harvard economist Claudia Golden, even if two lawyers have the same education, same specialty, and work the same number of hours, firms pay more to someone who is willing to always be on call and ready to be in the office when the firm needs them, as opposed to wanting a more regular schedule. This isn't sexism. It's just common sense. With more realistic categories and definitions, whatever wage gap remains would certainly narrow to the point of vanishing. So it seems that business leaders aren't bad at math simply because they don't only hire women. Those who claim that for the same work, women earn 77 cents on the dollar compared to men, on the other hand, are not merely bad at math, but at telling the truth. I'm Christina Hoff Summers of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. Every sensible immigration policy has two objectives. One, to regain control of our borders so that we decide who enters, and two, to find a humane way to deal with the 11 million illegal immigrants who now live among us. Start with the second. For both practical and moral reasons, America cannot and will not and should not expel 11 million people. That leaves us with two choices. Ignore them or figure out a way to legalize them. Ignoring them hasn't worked. But there's also a huge problem with legalization. It creates an irresistible incentive for new illegal immigrants to come. We say, of course, that this will be the very last, very final, never again, we're not kidding this time, amnesty. And everyone knows it's phony. That's what was said in 1986 when we passed the Simpson-Mazzoli immigration reform. It turned out to be the largest legalization program in American history. Nearly three million people got permanent residency. There was no enforcement. We now have 11 million new illegal immigrants in our midst. The irony of this whole debate, which bitterly splits the country, is that there is a silver bullet that would not just solve the problem, but also create a national consensus behind it. A vast number of Americans who oppose legalization and fear new waves of immigration would change their minds if we could radically reduce new, i.e. future, illegal immigration. And we can. First, build a barrier. Call it a wall, call it a fence, call it what you will. Add cameras and sensors, add drones, beef up the patrols. All that matters is that we regain control of the border. Fences work. The triple fence outside San Diego led to a 90% reduction in infiltration. Israel's border fence with the West Bank produced a similar decline. Even holier-than-thou Europeans have conceded the point. Hungary, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Austria, Greece, Spain, why even Norway have all started building border fences to stem the tide of Middle Eastern refugees. Then enforce two other measures a national e-verify system that makes it just about impossible to work if you are here illegally, and a functioning visa tracking system since 40% of illegal immigrants are visa overstays. The wall fence will, of course, be ugly. So are the concrete barriers to keep truck bombs from driving into the White House. Sometimes function has to supersede form. And don't tell me that this is our Berlin Wall. When you build a wall to keep people in, that's a prison. When you build a wall to keep people out, that's an expression of sovereignty. 
Of course, no barrier will be foolproof, but it doesn't have to be. It simply has to reduce the river to a manageable trickle. Once we do, everything becomes possible, including dealing with our 11 million illegal immigrants. So let's fix that. Track the visas, do we verify, build the damn barrier. It's ridiculous to say that it can't be done. And who would certify that the border is back in our control? I would have a neutral party, perhaps a commission of retired jurists, issue the judgment. Once they do, we legalize the 11 million, granting them the right to stay and work here. We can't give them citizenship. That's a bridge too far. You don't get to join the political destiny of the country by entering it illegally. But any children born here would be American, which means that over time, the issue resolves itself. The American people are legitimately angry at the price American society has paid due to illegal immigration. But they are also a generous people. Once they're assured that we do indeed control our borders, that anger will abate. A national consensus will emerge. Radical border control followed by radical legalization. No mushy compromise. A solution requires two acts of national will. Putting up a wall along with E-Verify and visa tracking and absorbing those who broke our laws to come to America. This is not a compromise meant to appease both sides without achieving anything. It's not some piece of hybrid legislation that arbitrarily divides illegals into those with five-year-old roots in America and those without, or some such mischief-making nonsense. If we do it right, not only will we solve the problem, we will get it done as one nation. I'm Charles Krauthammer for Prager University. Vanderbilt University, November 2015. 200 students rise up to protest the white privilege and microaggressions of the racist, bigoted Vanderbilt administration. The protesters don't offer any specific examples of discrimination, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that they feel victimized. The next day, a bag of dog poop shows up at the front door of the university's black cultural center. All hell breaks loose. Full of righteous indignation, student activist groups rush to Facebook to denounce the racist act. The police investigate. They quickly find the person responsible, but nobody is arrested. You know why? Because it turns out that the bag of excrement wasn't a racist attack. It was left by a blind girl with a service dog. She couldn't find a trash can, so wanting to do the responsible thing, she left the bag outside the door of a nearby building, knowing a janitor would pick it up and throw it away. The student group did apologize, but then they added another charge against the administration. The needs of students with disabilities on this campus are also marginalized. Seriously, this is not a joke. On the college campus today, feelings rule facts and victims are heroes. According to the left, all inequality in America is due to victimization. They start by claiming that all non-white people in America are victims of white privilege. Then come women. They're all victims of the patriarchy. Then come gays and lesbians and the transgendered. They're all victims of our heteronormative and homophobic society. But what if you haven't actually been victimized by anybody? That doesn't matter. To the left, so long as you feel victimized, you're a victim. Even if you have never actually experienced discrimination, you've surely been targeted by microaggressions. You know, nasty little words and phrases that weren't meant to be insults, but just are. If somebody asks you, where are you from? That's considered a xenophobic microaggression. They're implying that you are a foreigner. If a man holds open a door for a woman, which by the way, you're supposed to do, that's a sexist microaggression because he's treating her like she's a helpless female. Of course, he's also treating her like she's a woman, but how would he know? And heaven forbid anybody address you by your biologically accurate pronoun. What if she identifies as a man? In short, everyone's a victim, except of course, straight white males. Also, anybody who dares to disagree with the left. If you're guilty of either of those crimes, you must be confronted, even if doing so requires actual aggression, like, say, a riot. Here's a trick the left plays to justify their violence. First, they say it's okay to punch Nazis. Then they say that every conservative, in fact, everybody they disagree with, is a Nazi. But here's the biggest problem with the left's argument. They're based on feelings, not facts. Take white privilege. The only real privilege in America is American privilege. Everybody in America has it more than citizens of any other country in the world, 
the privilege to make your own decisions and live the life you choose. According to the liberal Brookings Institution, if you make just these three decisions, you'll do fine. And with drive and ambition, you'll probably do better than fine. First, finish high school. Second, don't have babies before you're married. Third, hold down a job. If you do these three things, you'll be on your way to the privilege of middle-class life, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender. Also, there's no patriarchy. Women already make up the majority of college graduates. According to Time Magazine, young single women without kids already earn more than their male counterparts. Oh, and gay and lesbian couples, they earn more than their straight counterparts too. These are facts, and facts don't care about your feelings. Neither will your employer if you get a job after you leave school. The moment you graduate, reality is gonna hit you like a truck. People who give you a paycheck expect you to produce. They expect you to work, hard. And all the claims of victimhood, all the whining, well, nobody cares. So, stop worrying so much about your feelings and start worrying a little more about being a good person, doing your best, and not getting in your own way. If you don't, the only thing you'll be a victim of is yourself. I'm Ben Shapiro, editor of The Daily Wire for Prager University. Rape, murder, war. They all have one thing in common. Men. Aggression, violence, ambition unchecked by conscience, all the stuff of toxic masculinity, right? And the solution is obvious. Make men less toxic. Make men less masculine. Make men more like women. But I'm here to tell you that that way of thinking is not only wrong, it's dangerous. Here's why. When you try to make men more like women, you don't get less toxic masculinity. You get more. Why? Because bad men don't become good when they stop being men. They become good when they stop being bad. Aggression, violence, and unbridled ambition can't be eliminated from the male psyche. They can only be harnessed. And when they are harnessed, they are tools for good, not for harm. The same masculine traits that bring destruction also defeat tyranny. The traits that foster greed also build economies. The traits that drive men to take foolish risks also drive men to take heroic risks. The answer to toxic masculinity isn't less masculinity. It's better masculinity. And we know what that looks like. It's a young man opening the door for a girl on their first date. It's a father working long hours to provide for his family. It's a soldier risking his life to defend his country. The growing problem in today's society isn't that men are too masculine. It's that they're not masculine enough. When men embrace their masculinity in a way that is healthy and productive, they are leaders, warriors, and heroes. When they deny their masculinity, they run away from responsibilities, leaving destruction and despair in their wake. The consequences can be seen everywhere. One in four fathers now lives apart from his children. And children who grew up without a dad are generally more depressed than their peers who have a mother and a father. They are at far greater risk for incarceration, teen pregnancy, and poverty. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. Of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, family is the most important. And we are called to recognize and honor how critical every father is to that foundation. That was said by then-Senator Barack Obama in 2008. If we are honest with ourselves, he went on, we'll admit that too many fathers are missing from too many lives and too many homes. As much as we try to deny the need for real masculine strength in society, there's no denying its necessity. Healthy families and strong communities depend on the leadership and bravery of good men. Yet, the current trend is to feminize young men in the hopes of achieving some utopian notion of equality and peace. And it starts at the earliest ages. In the school classroom, boys are invariably the problem. On the playground, aggressive games like dodgeball have long been banished. We tell young men that their intrinsic desire to compete is wrong. Everybody gets a trophy. Don't run up the score. This anti-male tilt continues on through higher education and into the workplace. It has created millions of tentative men, unhappy women, and confused boys and girls. Here's a secret that every woman knows. Women want real men. Men they can count on and, yes, look up to. No amount of feminist theory will change that. I don't know any woman at any age who is attracted to a passive man who looks to her to be his provider, protector, and leader. 
Every woman I know wants a strong, responsible man. That's not a consequence of a social construct or cultural pressure. It's innate. The devaluation of masculinity won't end well because feminine passive men don't stop evil. Passive men don't defend, protect, or provide. Passive men don't lead. Passive men don't do the things we have always needed men to do for society to thrive. In his book, The Abolition of Man, English social philosopher C.S. Lewis writes about this problem. He describes the tension between cerebral man and visceral man. By his intellect, Lewis explains, man is mere spirit and by his appetite, mere animal. We need both. Take away one and you're left with a man who's either weak or wicked. And in a world of wickedness, weak men are nothing more than enablers of wicked men. Rape, murder, war. They all have two things in common. Bad men who do the raping, murdering, and warring, and weak men who won't stop them. We need good men who will. It's not masculinity that's toxic. It's the lack of it. I'm Ali Stuckey for Prager University. Well, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, but I am here to tell you who not to vote for. Don't vote for anyone who says, I'll, I'll fight, fight for, for you. you, because that person is full of crap and has no intention of not only fighting for you, he doesn't know who you are. He or she's just moving on to the next town where they can point at the next sap and say, I'll fight for you. So tired of these politicians and their town hall meetings when somebody stands up and says, I'm pregnant with quadruplets. Um, I've been put on academic probation at the junior college and my milkman hates my guts. What are you going to do for me? And my answer is nothing. But here's the good news. We live in the United States. You can do something for you. Feel free to get a job and fight to keep it. Let me give you a really good example of people doing too much for others and us coming apart at the seams as a society. You guys remember when you were kids and you'd fake an illness and you'd stay home from school and you'd sit there on your sofa and you'd watch daytime TV. Hey, I'm Wally Thorpe, school of trucking. You can get to trucking too. Be a long haul trucker, get your license, hit the open road, make a good living. Learn typewriter repair, learn toaster repair. Remember all of those commercials? Every single commercial was geared to somebody who was out of work, but who wanted to work. Why? Well, it's Tuesday, it's noon. Who's gonna be home watching this TV show? People who are out of work. What do people who are out of work wanna do? They want to get to work. Thus, they learn to drive an 18 wheeler. Now, look at every commercial that's on during daytime TV wrongfully let go by an employer, slip and fall in a supermarket, you can sue. Hi, I'm attorney Lance Bassman, and I'll fight for you. See, the same people that say they're gonna fight for you are the same people trying to get you free crap when you won't get off your ever enlarging butt that's now melding and becoming one with your sofa. Fixing your screwed up life is not the government's job. And by the way, when does the government do a good job at fixing anything? I mean, I live in Los Angeles. We pay the most in taxes and we get the least in education. I want the government to do stuff that I can't do. Stop a war, end a plague, that kind of stuff. Stuff involving me, stuff involving my family, stuff involving my community. I can handle that. Also, don't vote for the politician who says, I know it's not a level playing field, I'm gonna level it for you. That's impossible. It is mathematically impossible to have a level playing field. What are we gonna do about fat people being discriminated against? Some people are born with one limb shorter than the other. Other people are born with a Brillo head. There's nothing we can do about it. The government's job is to clear the playing field not level the playing field, since it's impossible for them to level the playing field, just clear it of all the landmines and all the barbed wire and let us get to work. And don't worry, this is a great country. The harder you work, the more you score, and eventually your team goes to the Super Bowl. So let's review. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for. 
I'll tell you who not to vote for. Don't vote for the guy who says he's gonna get rid of all your problems, take care of you, and tuck your kids in at night. You see, humans need challenges to overcome, just like a muscle needs resistance to grow. In a zero gravity environment, an astronaut's muscles atrophy because there is no resistance. The government giving you a bunch of handouts and living your life for you is basically the equivalent of doing push-ups in outer space. Look, Ma, I can clap five times, just like Rocky in between sets. Big government is like the void of space. It's massive, constantly expanding, and if we immerse ourselves in it, we'll simply wither away. I'm Adam Carolla for Prager University. I recently discovered something startling about myself. It turns out that I'm a racist, sexist, misogynist. This came as quite a shock to me. How did this happen? As a person of color, a single woman with a graduate degree who grew up poor in a home without a father, I had a clear political path to follow, and I followed it. I voted for Barack Obama, twice. After all, we share the same skin color. His father was from Africa, mine was too. What other reasons did I need? I was inspired to see a black man rise to the highest office in the land. I believed his ascent would herald a new beginning, a new era of racial healing and harmony. We would finally have that frank discussion about race that everyone always talks about. I was also inspired by his wife. I was thrilled to see such a strong, opinionated black woman take the national stage. But then something happened. Actually, several somethings. I realized there was a big contradiction in my own life. I considered myself a free thinker, but I was thinking exactly what I was supposed to. I decided to start asking questions. I belonged to several campus feminist groups. I was even teaching feminism to inner city girls. Part of that teaching involved making the case for abortion. These girls needed to know that they had the right to make decisions about their own bodies. Surely, I thought, that's empowerment. But one day I asked myself, isn't it men who benefit most from consequence-free sex? Doesn't that give them even more power over women? And of course, abortion certainly doesn't empower the woman it prevents from ever being born. When I began to ask my other feminist friends how they reconcile these issues, they just got angry. I was called anti-woman, even by progressive men. But I'm not anti-woman, I thought. I am a woman. I just don't want to be a weak one. I want to be strong, like Michelle. At about the same time, while I was a student at the University of Texas at Dallas, the UT Austin Department of African Diaspora Studies released a statement in which they said, and I quote, African Americans are disproportionately affected by the saturation of our society by firearms. We demand that firearms be banned in all spaces occupied by black people on our campus. Wait a second, I thought, why would you want to ban firearms only in black areas? Doesn't that mean that you either think black people are more dangerous than other people or less worthy of protection? These questions did not endear me to my progressive friends. I was called a race traitor, even by white people. But I'm not anti-black. I am black. I just want to be safe, like Barack. I realized I didn't have a good answer. I only had more questions. Like, why were blacks doing so poorly in cities that had been run by Democrats for decades? Was it racism and sexism that was holding people back? Or was it something else? The more questions I asked, the less popular I became. But here's the funny thing. I started to feel better about myself. I decided that the very definition of empowerment required me to take responsibility for my own life. I wasn't going to be anyone's victim, which meant I had to protect myself. So I bought a gun. I started to advocate for gun rights. That cost me more friends. I joined the pro-life movement and walked in the March for Life. More friends, gone. Then I crossed the line. I voted Republican, the party that views me as an empowered individual, able to shape my own destiny. 
not as a member of a victim group. And that's how I became a racist, sexist, misogynist. I'm Antonia Okafor for Prager University.